Hi there. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And just to introduce everyone, this is Elizabeth Voss, uh, Associate Editor of Disobedient Media, and I'm speaking, I have the honor of speaking with Susie Dawson of the New Zealand Internet Party today. And it's pretty awesome. Thank you for having me. Well, I guess we're talking today about this uh, live streaming event that you have coming up with the Internet Party, which is going to attempt to draft some uh, legislation against spying. Is that right? Correct. Great. So um, what exactly are your short term and long term goals with that? Because That sounds really interesting. Well, basically, in New Zealand, there has been a series of really unpopular bills and acts passed through Parliament under urgency, uh, completely in contravention to the will of the average New Zealand citizen. And the bills have just been more and more draconian as they go on. They've been almost on an annual basis since 2013. And we're talking about things like bills to legalize warrantless spying, like they don't even have to get a warrant to spy on you, wow. um, war warrantless data requests, um, domestic visual surveillance, where they actually place cameras inside your domestic dwelling and spy on you. Again, warrantless domestic visual surveillance. Um, it, it is literally Orwell. It's not like, Orwellian, <laughs> actually, like all we are already in New Zealand in the situation where we have fully realized Orwell's vision. So, what we are doing is attempting to make a very public stand that this is not good enough. We expect better from a government. They're supposed to act in our interests and, and not in their interests. And where our legislators fail to act in our interests, then people, every regular, regular everyday people need to band together and begin to craft their own rules and their own laws. Well, that is extremely brave of you all to do that. And I absolutely applaud your efforts. And I'm wondering exactly like when you all are done with this legislation, are you going to be trying to get it uh, enacted somehow in New Zealand or is this going to be thanks to other organizations or what? Realistically, the New Zealand government is probably not going to take it seriously, but they, there is a variety of NGOs and interest groups worldwide, but also in New Zealand, who have been screaming, you know, bloody murder about these bills for years and largely being ignored, who I think will definitely embrace this effort. For example, the Human Rights Commission in New Zealand released reports stating that these laws are in um, violation of international law and human rights. And the government's response to that was to threaten to pull the funding for the Human Rights Commission and shut them down. So it's about time that we all showed a bit of solidarity with each other and stopped the government from bullying these groups and really began a serious pushback. Absolutely. And, um, with this event, exactly how can your uh, international audience who want to support you, how can they contribute and interact with what you're doing? Well, first of all, showing up is a really, a really, a really great start because what we've discovered is that the GCSB bill of 2013, which was the bill to retroactively legalize illegal spying on our own citizens by our spy agencies, that bill became the Aussie Data Retention Act, the USA Freedom Act, the UK IP bill. Wow. And even again in Canada. So we saw that our mass movement against that bill in 2013, which was a huge historic movement, um, failed to prevent that bill from being passed. And as soon as it failed in New Zealand, the same legislation was mimicked across the five eyes. So we feel like since it started in our country, that we need to start with pushing back. And we hope that if we can have some success in New Zealand, that it can have a roll on effect across the rest of the world in a positive way for once rather than a negative way. So in terms of supporting us, showing up is definitely step one, learning about what's been happening to us because it is happening to you guys as well. Definitely. Step two would be helping to resource us. We've been um, starved of resources at every turn. We are taking on spies and billionaires 
and we need money to do it, is that especially as we're in the middle of a political campaign, our domestic media has completely blacked us out and, and will not acknowledge our campaign or our initiatives. We have amazing social media support and we can summon thousands of followers and participants of our own accord, but we can't compete with the other political parties unless we have the dollars to purchase. Me the only way we can break through into the media in New Zealand is with money. So they won't voluntarily give us coverage, but if we can purchase advertising space, then that's the only way that we can penetrate and get the messages through to mainstream New Zealanders. So we can accept up to 1,500 New Zealand dollars from any person in the world. We will not on principle accept money from any corporation or from any government. But ma and pa, you know, donors from around the world can choose to support us. And that will increase the visibility of this campaign in New Zealand and increase our chances of success. So you can, if you wish, donate at internet.org.nz. That would be greatly appreciated. But most of all, you, even if you, if you don't have a dollar to give, you can tell people what is going on and tell people about this initiative. Check out the hash anti-spy bill hashtag. See the information that's on our website and just share it everywhere that you can. Any forum you can think of, any site, email media organizations and ask why they aren't covering this. Just tell your friends about what's going on because it's really scary stuff. And we have the global public really has slipped walked into this situation. That is absolutely, absolutely something that everybody should support. And I think that in the US, we saw a similar thing as well. The, the, the individuals that tried to support Bernie Sanders saw both the media blackout and obviously uh, it, the, it did not go too well for them either. So I think some of us do understand the type of situation you're talking about, just as far as the media blackout is concerned. Um, of course, whenever you challenge the system and you challenge the way things function and you refuse to just play the, the um, red versus blue game, Exactly. then you're actively suppressed. Uh, so what are the things, some of the things that the Internet Party of New Zealand has done before this, uh, other than this specific meeting? I know that Kim.com was deeply involved in this for a while and he's not leading the party right now. Could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So Kim founded the party in 2014. We did have a massive event called the Moment of Truth during the 2014 election cycle. We have elections every three years in New Zealand rather than every four years, like in the States. So at the moment of truth, Edward Snowden, Glenn Greenwald, Kim.com, and Julian Assange from WikiLeaks all spoke about what was happening with these mass surveillance bills and the legalizing of spying wholesale on the entire populations of our countries rather than the traditional targeted surveillance where someone um, they have they suspect that someone has done something and they apply for a warrant and then they spy just on that individual instead they have just been dragnetting all of the communications of all of the citizenry of each of the five eye countries and other countries and storing that for you know generations to come for later use so we saw firsthand at, at the Moment of Truth event documents, <clears throat> documents from the Snowden files, which proved conclusively that this was happening in New Zealand. Yet the government and the Prime Minister at the time basically were bald-faced lying and saying, no, our spy systems are just a big antivirus program. And <laughs> literally, that was what they said. <laughs> and, and there's no mass surveillance in New Zealand. But time and time again, they keep passing bill after bill that is very clear that, yes, there is mass surveillance in New Zealand. And they're attempting to use this legislation to really whitewash what they had been doing all along. So the Internet Party itself is really innovative in terms of using tech and using social media um, to deliver its campaign and, and campaigning in ways that are a bit out of the ordinary, <laughs> but have been really popular. And in 2017, our slogan is to hash update NZ because 
New Zealand doesn't just need a reboot. New Zealand needs to be updated. We are living with this archaic political system that we've inherited from 150 years ago, much as you guys are. And it is the entire system that needs to be changed in order to truly have a representative government because the status quo system is failing on every front. We have record homelessness and record income inequality and record youth unemployment and youth suicide. And it just goes on and on and on. The current system has abjectly failed and the evidence of that is all around us. So what Internet Party is doing is trying to create a future in a country that feels like the future is really bleak. Absolutely. And it seems as well like at, the, at this time there has uh, developed a unique opportunity, as you mentioned, to go around the old establishment legacy media in order to get your word out. And that seems to be what this event is partially about too, if I'm understanding it. Yeah, we've, we've discovered in the past that when we get enough international attention and enough international media coverage, that we can actually embarrass the, the national media into acknowledging us. <laughs> because once, there are, once there's international media asking questions of the national media about what's going on and the national media can't answer them, then all of a sudden they try to play catch up and pretend like they were interested all along. So for us, it's a more effective strategy to work with international media than necessarily with the national media. Interesting. So uh, as I understand it, Kim.com and, ba and journalist uh, Barrett Brown will be on the panelists for your event. Um, do you have any idea what they'll be speaking about specifically or just, just um, helping people to draft this legislation? Well, Kim.com is probably the most high profile victim of surveillance and specifically of the NSA and their New Zealand counterpart, the GCSB. His home, his home was raided in January of 2012 by a hundred military style police, including FBI, um, with attack dogs and helicopters and you name it, over what was supposed to be supposedly a copyright case except it has now emerged years later via the High Court that there is in fact no such thing as criminal copyright infringement in New Zealand. So he is now, so that, that, that fact has invalidated all of the original search warrants on premises and the premises for which his home was raided and he was arrested and um, briefly jailed. So he is now filing a huge suit against the New Zealand government for damages because his businesses were dismantled, his assets were frozen. Um, he was attacked from every quarter by the government, largely at the behest of the United States of America. So he is going to speak tonight about the impact on himself and his family and his business of having been targeted by the spies. Barrett Brown is, I think you know, is an award-winning journalist. Absolutely, yes. He won the National Magazine Award and awards from the New York Press Club while incarcerated, while even in solitary confinement. Uh, his work was so significant in the field of private surveillance and the intersection of private surveillance and private intelligence agencies. I mean, that the fact that private intelligence agencies exist at all is just mystifying to me. That we have allowed a situation where the capitalist profit model is inserted into what was traditionally government functions is just incre incredible because as soon as you have profit involved, then that forces growth and growth means more targets. So then you're targeting for money. You're not actually targeting because there's any... Uh, crime ongoing, but actually because it is the growth of your industry is dependent on it. And Barrett's investigations into these agencies were so significant that sure enough, he was targeted and he was also imprisoned on these trumped up charges. And so he, his amazing talent, though, has shone through even from behind bars. So yet again, we have another person who's able to speak from personal experience about what it is really like to be targeted by these agencies and also to share the knowledge that he does have about how they function, what they get up to, um, why it is not okay, and hopefully what we can start to do about it.
Absolutely. That will be really something to look forward to uh, seeing you all speak about. And it's also horrifying to me that these NGOs or not NGOs, but private uh, organizations like you're talking about uh, are not accountable to the public in any way. We're even a corrupt agency. We can, in America, we can FOIA them. There are procedures you can go to to at least interact with them, but in a private company situation, you can't do that. So, yeah. You are absolutely right. So in New Zealand, we have, we get told, but we have oversight. The spy agencies mm -hmm. have oversight channels, you know, everything's okay, trust your government. But in fact, there are two oversight channels. One is the um, Parliamentary Ministerial Oversight Committee, uh, which is a group of five, which is basically two in opposition and two in government. And then the Prime Minister has the final vote, the fifth vote. So it is virtually impossible for, <laughs> for them to ever reach any conclusion that goes against what the government wants because they have a three out of five voting majority no matter what happens. So then we have the Inspector General of Intelligence Services, who is not empowered to investigate anything except for conduct or cases involving the two government spy agencies. So she has no say whatsoever over the private surveillance and security industry. So this is precisely what you were just talking about. What yeah. it means is that those agencies can just subcontract to these private security companies and private intelligence agencies and there's seemingly no redress whatsoever. Now, we've had some really egregious conduct by those private agencies in New Zealand, cases involving entrapment, them using military-grade technologies against unarmed, ordinary civilians, young mothers, students, young activists. Um, they've had agents infiltrate activist groups and, and adopt false identities to engage in long-term sexual relationships with young activists, one as young as 16 years of age, one of their targets, um, whereas these guys are in their 30s and 40s. Just really despicable conduct. And the only thing that could be done about it was a complaint could be filed um, against their, life, their security license in a very low-level tribunal. So there's no criminal comeback. There's no way to hold the employing agencies to account. These companies can be set up and folded and set up again by the same people. And it just really feels like the citizens of New Zealand are being preyed upon and it seemed like there was nothing that we could do about it. So those are some of the additional issues that you'll hear us broaching tonight is not just the specific amendments that need to be made to the existing legislation, but more the overarching principles, which are that it is not okay for an agent or a subcontractor of the state to commit crimes against the physical persons of New Zealand citizens, to entrap activists, to have sexual relationships with activists under false premises, to spy on children. We've just found out recently that they are collecting surveillance data on minors and storing that data for the long term. So these are some of the issues that we hope to address alongside, um, we would, you know, banning the domestic visual surveillance, which I think is particularly horrific. Well, that is just so, so deeply important for all of us. And I really hope that people do get a better understanding through the work that you're doing, that this is happening and the degree to which it's happening, because I think at least in the US, a lot of people, even though they, they understood that what's a uh, bit of what Snowden uh, revealed, they just are not aware of how bad this really is. And I think that what you're doing, I hope, will open some people's eyes about this. But, um, Snowden was so important because he proved that it is that they are collecting everybody's data. And he took what had been for years considered conspiracy theory and made it provable fact. He gave the raw source material so that we can actually sit there and pour over their PowerPoint presentations and see what they're doing to us and how they're doing it to us. But the issue is that it presented the theory so we could see the collection side of it. What we have not 
being able to get through to the public is the link between the collection of the information and then that information being used to target people on the ground. So there's this idea that the collection is passive, like they just they just keep it all and store it all, you know, and the, the, that's the issue. Oh, but the issue is, bad guys. They, yeah. Yeah, the issue is that they keep it, they store it, and then the information, it's like a waterfall that goes down across all of these security agencies, you know, private and public, um, from the mayoralties to the police agencies to the private contractors to the international committees and the national committees. And that information is acted on. People are targeted on the basis of that information. And with the profit model involved, the target group is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So once upon a time, it was the just the radical activists, and then it was the activists and the journalists. And now we see it's the activists and the journalists and the researchers and anybody who is having any kind of political impact whatsoever, whether it's climate change scientists or whether it's anti-GMO nutritionists or organic, you know, ad advocates for organic farming and it just it has been bigger and bigger and bigger and now we see it's in our schools it's happening to our kids you know there's a camera every three meters down the block and where does it end you know with the money that is involved in circulating through it 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 cannot go anywhere good well, that is <laughs> it is so really drastically important that you guys are doing what you're doing because this is really becoming like as you said earlier an orwellian type of reality that we're living in now and I think some people seem to think that if they don't have anything dissenting or wrong if they just shut up and keep quiet then they will be fine and I think that is the absolute most dangerous thing uh, for people to on a mass level uh, feel or think and I think that what you're all doing is it's so important in changing that mentality for people. I hope so um, because it's interesting that the western countries demonize the third world countries and say that they are authoritarian and totalitarian and et cetera, et cetera. Um, in my experience, the Western world is far more totalitarian and authoritarian and the systems that they have developed to constrain and const control their domestic populations are horrifically advanced. And we see now the third world countries or the second world countries adopting the legislation that the Western world has already enacted in their own countries. So the West is now leading the way in political oppression. Very true. And so because our audience is going to be obviously from some different places to New Zealand, I'm wondering where, uh, when exactly the live event is gonna take place uh, as far as U.S. time and and uh, how when people exactly can get a hold of you all and what you're doing. So this event is Sunday, sixth of August, from eight p.m. New Zealand Standard Time until eleven p.m. New Zealand Standard Time. It is now twenty past eleven in the morning in New Zealand. So we're talking about eight and a half hours from now. Okay. Um, the event will begin. So that would make that about 3 a.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, I believe, America. Yes, it's not a, it's not a particularly friendly time <laughs> for you guys. Well, we do what we can. <laughs> I'm well aware of that. Unfortunately, we couldn't get around that very easily. Um, however, obviously, all the playbacks will be available um, okay. and you'll be able to view it at any time you know, of your leisure. Well, we thank you so much for speaking with us today. And we hope that despite the, the time issues that a lot of people will participate and that you guys get a lot of support for what you're doing. Oh, thank you. If it makes you feel better, it's 2.20 a.m. where I am right now and I've got more media to do. Oh, so maybe, maybe we're just going to have to make, you know, little sacrifices of some sleep if we really want to be a part of change. Absolutely. And I hope people do. And thank you for everything you're doing. And thank you for speaking with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much.